This is Let's Be Briefed, where we cover mysteries, conspiracies, and other unknowns each week. Let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah. And I'm Sydney. And this week we're talking about Portlock, Alaska and the murders there. Um, So Portlock, also known as Port Chatham, Alaska, was a thriving village on the southern tip of the Kenai Peninsula that after a series of mysterious murders and disappearances, the town had to be abandoned in 1950 for their safety. Uh, do you know anything about this, Sydney? Um, you know, I think I've at least listened to a podcast episode about this, but like you said murders and I was like, wait, what? Like I thought, I don't even know what I thought. I just knew that there was a town that disappeared. So I, this, a lot of this will probably be new to me or maybe it'll come back as I listen. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So yeah, our setting for this mystery is the Kenai Peninsula, which I have a map for Sydney to look at. No one else. But we'll post it. Um the Black Star. I'll post the map on Instagram. We'll post it. Yeah. And Facebook. Cute. That's a great idea actually. Um yeah the Black Star I added, that's where Portlock was. So way down there on the southern tip. And The Kenai Peninsula actually has a lot of stuff crammed into, like, a relatively small area in Alaska terms. But on this peninsula alone are mountain ranges, glaciers, ice fields, boreal forests, marshes, tundra, lakes of various sizes, and coastline with beaches. Also, in 1957, oil was discovered on the peninsula, and today the main types of employment there are fishing, oil, and tourism. There's also a bunch of protected areas, such as the Kenai Fjords National Park and the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And there's also a lot of land that is still privately owned by Native tribes and by corporations, and there aren't any developments on these lands. So there's definitely areas, like, still to this day on the peninsula that have not really been explored by humans. Ooh. Yeah, but... The southern tip where Portlock was is pretty much deserted today, which is strange, and we'll get into it. Um, But Portlock, Alaska, which I kept hearing is also could be called Port Chatham, because Port Chatham Bay is like the bay that the town was built on, so it seems like these two names are like interchanged a lot. So I'm just going to say Portlock for this episode. But in 1786, Royal Navy Captain Nathaniel Portlock sailed through the area and was impressed with all the natural resources there. And then in 1791, English explorer George Vancouver came through and mapped the area and named the bay after one of his ships, the HMS Chatham. So this area offers sheltered a sheltered bay from storms, thick forests surrounding it for timber, plenty of fish, and both coal and chromite were there nearby to mine so it's almost like a prime spot for a town to sprout up and eventually a town did spring up in the early 1900s that's a long time in between discovery and settlement i think it's just like so hard to get to that for it to become like an actual town town took a while for people to go and build there right yeah it is a long time between the two but yeah cannery was built to process 200,000 pounds of halibut like that's a big operation and the coal and chromite mines came into operation that were close by and there were also fox and mink farms so there were plenty of good like job opportunities in the area for anyone to come. And the town also built up a school, a pool hall, a general store, and a post office. 
And also Saldovia was nearby, about 60 miles away, and it's still town today. So it's not like you were totally in the middle of nowhere, necessarily. I mean, it would take a while to walk or whatever, 16 miles, because it's mountainous. But there was people nearby this town, too, so. Right. 16 miles. There's no roads. There's a road now, but I'm not sure when it was first made. Oh. Well, I mean, there's not a road now, I guess, because actually, because the town's abandoned. I don't know if there was ever a road. Scary. Yeah. So I guess you, I mean, you could sail around to get to Saldovia, at least. Like, boat yeah. would probably be fastest, but... Um, yeah, but soon after the town was started, uh, there were many strange stories of something unknown in the woods causing problems. So these stories continued to surface throughout the years until everyone picked up and left in 1949, leaving just the postmaster behind. Why would he stay? (laughs) Because he's the postmaster. I guess you probably can't leave. I think so, but just after a year, he calls it quits as well, and that's the end of Portlock as a town, once he leaves. It's like, he only stayed there another year. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be out in the woods alone <laughs> either. I know, that's true. And also, like, what does he need to sort mail for? Yeah, if no what there? mail? Yeah, I'm not sure why he stayed. I feel like he did feel a duty to stay, but... The only letters he gets are for himself. It's like the Grinch, when the Grinch is <laughs> giving himself presents or whatever. Oh, that's really sad, actually. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to get into some of the strange stories that circulated. And a lot of these stories don't have a lot of details, and they weren't really written down at the time. So it is a lot of speculation. Which I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But let's get into them. So, first story that was somewhat documented was 1905. So, workers in the fish processing plant, so the cannery, they all walk off the job due to something in the woods that was bothering their camp. And the seafood company actually brings in armed security to protect the area to get the workers to come back. I want to know what it was. I know! Because, like, they, I would think that they would, if it was, like, a bear, they would know. You know, like, yeah, they live there. They're definitely interacting with the wildlife. And if it's that big of a deal, ooh. Right. Or, like, a moose. Like, they're going to be very familiar with all of the normal animals. Especially if they're living in a camp. Right. Because, like, the town was starting to be established in, like, 19... one I think so this is like four years in like there's not a lot of stuff built yeah they're in the wilderness still basically so that's kind of spooky uh the next thing I have jumps pretty far but in 1923 uh Sergius Moonen I don't know if that's how you say his name but that's how I'm gonna say it and his girlfriend hear very high-pitched whistling while they're walking in the woods. So loud and high-pitched that it hurts their ears. Oh. And a week later, on the beach, they spot a large, hairy, bipedal creature. Oh my god. <laughs> so we're in Bigfoot territory. Ooh. <laughs> uh, 1931, there's the mysterious death of Andrew Kamluck. So he's a logger in the nearby woods, and he's actually the owner of the logging. Well, from what I could find, it says he was the owner of this logging company. And it said that his crew slowly abandoned their position due to things like going missing when they put them down. Mm. And like other noises in the woods. Do you think he could have been a person? Well, let me continue and then you tell me. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) You know he can't just listen and not No, no, I know. No, that's a good question, but let me just finish this one one and you tell me if it was a human or not. Um, I mean, this is speculation still. This is the story, but that uh, he, because he was the owner, he was the last one to stay in the woods and he was still trying to log and do his job. And 
he was found killed at the job site, struck in the head by a heavy piece of logging equipment. Like, something so heavy that, like, no one person could lift and throw themselves. He was struck in the head with it. Oh. I mean... He kind of tripped, I guess, and fell and hit his head on it. But I think it, it was, like, tipped over. Yeah, I guess I'm speechless. Um... <laughs> Wow, you're speechless. Could he have, like, set it on something and it fell or had it, like... I mean, I don't know. Anything could have happened, right? Yeah, I mean, there's no one there to see what happened. I can come up with a way that it works without any details because I don't know any of the... Like, since we don't know, like, this was X number of inches, like... I know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wish they had put more details in it. But this was 1931, I guess. Yeah, I mean, no one. And people were spooked anyway, like, starting to become more spooked from the other stuff. Like, you know, the cannery people leaving from here. Yeah, right. I mean, this isn't the first thing that happened, so I'm sure everyone's freaked out. Yeah. Yeah, and also in 1931, there's a prospector who comes to town, like, asking the locals a good stream to look for gold in. And he finds a route that's, like, further in the mountains, and he goes there with his pack mule, and both are never seen again. Which, it is the wilderness. Right. Like, especially if he's not, like, yeah. I feel like people think they can, they're better than the elements, but the elements are, yeah, they'll kill him. Especially Alaska. A lot of people. Right. Right, like, there's nothing. But it is said, the story... I mean, again, there's not a lot of details, so it's probably just someone adding their own flavor, but they did say, like, he had walked there from other places, so he's, like, very... Oh. Yeah. I mean, it, really, the only way to get there would be walking or a boat. Right. And he had a mule, so it's assumed that he walked all the way to get there. Yeah. Walked. So, like, it's not like he's unfamiliar with the terrain yeah oh my gosh but yeah and then sometime in the 1940s could not find an actual date but there's tom larson he spots a big hairy creature on the beach eating fish out of a fish trap so the story goes that he went out from his cabin in the early morning to gather the fish he had caught in his fish trap and when he turns the bin to go to the beach he saw what he first thought was a bear stealing fish from the trap but once he looked closer, he saw it had hands like a human's and was eating the fish whole, like eating the bones and all in like one bite, which I don't know if that's not how bears eat it, but like he knew what a bear was. Yeah, how do bears eat them? Right. And he said this when he started looking closer, it was not a bear. Oh my god. And so he, he actually said he turned away to get his gun from his cabin, like thinking, because he had heard stories at this point of this creature, right? Because this is like 50, or no, this is like 35 years after the cannery story. Right. So like he had never believed it or anything, but he was thinking like, oh, I'll get my gun. Maybe I can kill it and it, there'll be proof or we can see what it actually is or something. So he went to get his gun and when he returned, the creature was still there. So like he kind of started sneaking closer and then he like cocked his gun like ready to shoot and the creature like heard like, his gun being prepped to shoot and turned to look at him. And he said he saw, like, such a human expression of sadness on the creature that, like, he couldn't actually kill it. And he said he just backed away slowly instead and just went back to his cabin. What? <laughs> yeah. That's his story. I don't know. He said he had killed, like, so many creatures for food or for protection and he had never seen an expression like that on any other animal's face. He should have killed it and I'm pretty upset with him. <laughs> He has empathy. Unacceptable. I mean, it's kind of a weird story. Like, he... You you kill creatures when you're in Alaska. Like, you do it out of protection or for food. He's Right. He's very used to... Hunting. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, what if it's a person dressed like a... Or not... Maybe it's wearing a bear suit. Like, because it has bear fur for clothes. But why wouldn't you put the fur on the inside? I don't know. Um... <sighs> Maybe there's a reason, but, or is it just, like, there's those people who have, like, the genetic hairy 
Wolfman. That's true. Yeah, I don't know.